This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 30, Agastya. Last time, we finished the story of Nala and Damayanti, and Yudhishthira learned some dice tricks from Burhadashva. If you found parts of the Nala storyline difficult to follow, you're not alone. For instance, I find it hard to explain why Nala remained in hiding for so long after he discovered the whereabouts of his wife and had the ability to regain his old form at any time. He apparently stayed in Ritaparna's service for a year or more, when he could have reclaimed his name, wife, and family at any time. It is the kind of storyline that would make a great opera, but the narrative is hard to swallow as literature. Perhaps some earlier version of the story had more details to fill in the logical gaps. The question of an original version also makes me wonder about the curious parallels between Nala's story and the Pandava story. For instance, Damayanti had to choose from five Nalas at her Swamvara, while Draupadi chose five husbands. The dice match the dice match is an obvious parallel, but how about the whole difficulty with Damayanti's clothing, which echoes Draupadi's disrobing? Later, the Pandavas, like Nala, will assume menial positions in a king's court. There is a mysterious kinship between the tale of the Pandavas and the tale of Nala, but who knows if we'll ever work out their genealogies. So, we left off with the Pandavas, still in the forest and miserable, over news that Arjun was starving himself on a mountainside. Their next visitor was the sage Narada, and Yudhishthira asked Narada after the benefits of visiting the holy places. Narada then provided a long, detailed travel guide to the ancient tourist spots. I will spare you all the gruesome details. The list of sites runs 30 pages, listing scores of sacred fords, rivers, lakes, and mountains. At each of these locations, one could attain different merits. For instance, at many fords, a little fasting and meditation there could win as much merit as several horse sacrifices. It is interesting to note that at this time in Indian history, the holy sites were not temples, cities, or relics. Instead, they are all natural locations of spiritual power. No mention is made whether these sites even had temples for worship. The whole focus is on the natural environment. So far as I can tell, no mention of a temple has been made so far in the Mahabharata. Other than Brahmins, it is unclear how the common people focus their worship. A few interesting anecdotes from this long list of destinations include the Sapta Sarsvata Ford, where the famous holy man Mankanaka found enlightenment. There he cut his hand, and from the wound flowed vegetable juice. The little guy was so excited at his achievement that he started dancing in delight. Mankanaka's soul had reached such a fine vibration that all the entities around him, animate and inanimate, started dancing in sympathetic resonance. The neighboring sadhus were disturbed to see the very earth and trees begin dancing and flying around. So, as they often do, they ran complaining to their patron god Shiva. Shiva appeared before Mankanaka and asked him, Why are you dancing like that? The giddy sadhu pulled out a thorn and showed Shiva how his blood ran vegetarian. Shiva laughed and said, That's very nice. Now check this out. Shiva then pricked his thumb and from the cut ran ashes. Mankanaka threw himself on the ground and worshipped the god, saying, No other god is more supreme than Rudra. Thou art the maker and cause of the worlds. By thy grace all the other gods enjoy this reality. Shiva then blessed Mankanaka and said, Anyone who bathes here shall find nothing is beyond their reach. It would be interesting to map out all of these ancient locations, but we can be sure that they extended east to the Bay of Bengal and west to the Indus, north into the Himalayas and south into the Deccan region. The loss of the Sarsvati River must have been traumatic, because many of these sites were located on the banks of that legendary river. While each of these holy places held great merit, it would appear the very best place for a sadhu to make his fire was the field of the Kurus, Kurukshetra. Narada said, The Naimisha woods are sacred, but no place stands out like Kurukshetra. Even the dust that blows from that place brings blessings. Those who dwell in Kurukshetra are already in heaven. Even if one just says, I shall go to Kurukshetra, has assured himself of salvation. When Narada finished describing all the sacred locations, he concluded by pointing out that many of these places were infested with rakshasas and thus no one had been able to visit them for years. Narada instructed the Pandavas to lead the holy men on a tour of these sites, where they might protect them and clear the sites of dangers. He pointed out that the last man to accomplish this grand tour had been their uncle Bhishma. Bhishma had gained immense merit for his actions, but Yudhishthira will gain eight times that merit, because he will be leading and protecting other holy men. 
The next visitor to the Kanyaka woods was the sage Lomasha, who had just been sent from Indra's palace to send the Pandavas on their pilgrimage. The sage began by bringing the brothers news of Arjun's great achievements, the WMD and his journey to heaven. He then recited the message he had been sent to tell. He said, Your younger brother Arjun shall soon return with the weapons you desired, but he has one more deed to accomplish which even the gods cannot complete. You are not to worry about Karna. That son of a Sutta is not worth even one sixteenth of Arjun in battle. All of your fears and worries will be dispelled once the left-handed archer returns. Lomasha concluded his message, saying, Your brother also requested that I accompany you on the tour of the sacred forts. I have completed this tour three times already, so I shall be your guide. Yudhishthira readily agreed, and he began making preparations for departure. First, he called together all his dependents, presumably Brahmins who preferred handouts over hard traveling. He directed them to go to Hastinapur, where Dhritarashtra would take care of them. He said, If that king will not help, then go to Panchala, where you certainly will be well received. Then the brothers packed their weapons and set out for the first stop on their itinerary, Naimisha Forest. From there they wandered eastward, past the confluence of the Yamna and Ganga, and eventually onto a place called Agastya's Hermitage at Durjaya. Yudhishthira asked Lomasha to tell them more about this famous hermit, Agastya. Lomasha began with an anecdote about a pair of foul, rude asuras who used to live in this area. The two were brothers, the eldest named Ilvala and the younger Vatapi. Ilvala had the singular talent that he could summon a soul back into its body after it had died. The best he could think to do with this ability was to kill and cook his younger brother, feed the meat to some unsuspecting victim, and then recall his brother. The two laughed uproariously as Vatapi materialized and blew the victim into pieces. They took particular pleasure in playing this trick on Brahmins. I guess they should not have been eating meat in any case. Lomasha then turned to the subject of Agastya. Agastya must have been a well-known heroic hermit because no time is wasted on his background. The story picks up when Agastya had a powerful dream of his ancestors, all tied up and hanging upside down in a cave. Agastya asked them how he could help them, and they all cried out in one voice, Offspring, we are your own ancestors and have ended up here because we have no one to carry on our line. If you were to beget an heir, it will rescue us from this hell. Agastya agreed to find himself a wife, but he still had the difficulty that there was no woman he felt worthy of him. Taking matters into his own hands, Agastya assembled animal parts that he felt had merit and gave this strange assembly to the king of Nishada, whose queen soon thereafter gave birth to a daughter. The girl's name was Lopamudra. Agastya returned to his hermitage and waited until Lopamudra was old enough to marry. After many years had passed, Agastya presumed the girl was ready, and he returned to Nishada asking for Lopamudra. The king hesitated to send his noble daughter to live in the woods with a dirty old sadhu, but he feared what Agastya might do if he refused. Lopamudra allayed his worries. She said, Please, father, do not worry on my account. Allow me to marry Agastya and save you from trouble. With crude ceremony, Agastya took the young princess as his wife. His first command was for her to shed her jewels and silks and to wear bark and deerskin instead. The girl obediently did as she was told and took up the rough life of a hermit's wife, even joining in with him in his meditations and fasting. The hermit was pleased with his compliant wife and he told her to get ready because it was time to consummate. The girl bowed and said, No doubt a husband takes a wife in order to have children. Please allow me a small pleasure in return. Please let me lie in as fine a bed as I used to have in my father's palace, and I would like you to come with me in nice clothes while I am adorned with jewels. The old hermit asked, Do you see any jewels here, girl? Where would I find such a bed? Lopamudra replied, with all the spiritual power that they say you have, obtaining these things should be quite easy. The old guy thought about it for a while and then said, It's true that I have such merit, but I will not waste it on such frumpery. The girl said, There aren't many days left, Lord, and I do not wish to lie with you unless it is just so. Agastya reluctantly agreed to her terms, but he still wasn't going to waste his powers making cheap miracles, so he decided instead to hit up some rich guy for a donation. His first target was the king Shritarvan, who had a reputation as a wealthy man. Agastya visited this king and asked, Sire, I have come in search of wealth. Give me a share of yours, if that can be done without depriving others. 
The king well knew what Agostia might do if he turned the hermit down. So he summoned the best liars in the kingdom, his accountants. The accountants presented the king's financial statements and asked Agostia to name his price from the kingdom's profits. The hermit examined the books, but the accounts showed that the king had not made a profit in decades. The naive sadhu had no training in reading financial statements, so he gullibly took the accountants at their word. He believed there was no extra wealth to be gained here. The king volunteered that his neighboring king was really wealthy and offered to escort Agastya to his neighbor's borders. The king volunteered that his neighboring king was really wealthy and offered to escort Agastya to his neighbor's borders. The hermit accepted the king's offer and the two departed for the border. The second king, Vadriashva, had spies at King Shrutavan's court, and so he had already heard that how that king had gotten Agastya safely off his hands. So Vadriashva used the same trick cooking up a set of books for Agastya to look over. For a second time, Agastya conceded that this king was also operating at a loss and could not spare a penny. The hermit asked, Where else might I find the wealth that I require? Vadriyashva replied, We do have some wicked daityas for a neighbor, whose leader is called Ilvala. These murderous asuras have an immense hoard of wealth that they won by deceit and cruelty. The Asura Uvala was the same demon we learned of earlier who enjoyed blowing up Brahmins. The two kings and Agastya then traveled to Ilvala's court, and Agastya again made his request for treasure. Ilvala welcomed them all and offered them a banquet, with his brother cooked in the main dish. These kings both had heard of Ilvala's pastimes, and they had no appetite. Agastya, on the other hand, ate heartily. He ate the entire meat dish and then leaned back in satisfaction. Ilvala giggled in anticipation and then called back his brother. Rather than getting the spectacle of an exploding sadhu, his guest let out a long, wet fart. Vatapi had been completely digested. He was no more. Considering that his trick had just backfired horrifically, Ilvala took it pretty well. I guess he'd met his match and knew it. The Asura reluctantly divulged 10,000 cows, as many gold pieces, and a golden chariot to each of the kings while Agastya demanded three times as much for his share. It must have been quite a sight to see Ovala's demonic retainers delivering a king's ransom to the yard of a dilapidated old dugout. The hermit had all the riches arrayed before his wife. Lopamudra then said, My lord, you have carried out my wish. Now beget on me a powerful child. Agastya said, Very well then, but you must choose. Would you rather have a thousand sons, or a hundred who are each worth ten, or ten who equal one hundred each, or a single son worth a thousand. Lopamudra replied, I'll take one son who equals a thousand, for a wise and virtuous son is better than many of no virtue. Lomasha concluded his story, saying, So the old sadhu and his wife got together, and the couple had a son, the mighty sage Durdasyu. After all the storytelling, the pilgrims resumed their tour, visiting the rivers Nanda and Kaushiki, where one sins are washed away in a single dip. Next time, we'll hear the story of Rishya Shringa and what this strange fellow has to do with unicorns and the medieval legend of Barlam and Josephette. Thanks for listening. <laughs>